Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament book of James. The New Testament book of James. We've been going through this wonderful book of the Bible, the book of wisdom for the New Testament, a very practical book in helping us with our walk with the Lord. And we've worked our way now to the book of James in chapter number two. The book of James in chapter number two. As a context, remember that the book of James is the oldest book of the New Testament, written in a time where Christianity is still considered a sect of Judaism, that many of the Hebrew people have come to know Christ as their Savior. And with that, they've had a freedom from the religion that they were in, from the bondage of the law, from the, you have to do this and have to do this and have to do this. Unfortunately, as they got saved, they made a reaction to swing the other way and say, wahoo, now that I'm saved, I don't have to do anything. I got my fire insurance card. I'm not going to hell. I don't have to do anything. And so James, being the pastor of the church of these folks, is trying to correct that behavior and trying to give them a biblical understanding of this idea of our relationship with the Lord and what's all entailed with it. So if you don't mind to take your copy of the word of God and look with me in the book of James chapter number two. The book of James in chapter number two, and if you don't mind, let's um, get a good running start. May I say... Uh, verse number 12. All right. Um, <laughs> verse number 12. James chapter 2, verse number 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that will be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that have showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say that he hath faith, and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace and be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you shall give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it had not works, is dead, being alone." Yea, a man may say, though they have faith and I have works, show me thy faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. If thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness that he was called the friend of God. Ye see, see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So notice, if you don't mind, a phrase that we find in the book of James chapter 2. The book of James chapter 2, and notice with me in verse 23, a very powerful phrase, the friend of God. The friend of God. And with the Lord's help, we want to hit this idea here, being God's friend, being the friend of God. Now in the context here, we can't divorce the context. We have to understand what it's speaking about. That in here, as James is dealing with the Hebrew people and trying to explain the way that we live our Christian life, he does put an idea here. Now, some people 
uh, get confused over the book of James on this portion. In fact, Martin Luther, the reformer, once called that James was the gospel of straw, meaning that he felt like it fell apart. It just didn't match his idea. And we understand that in order to have salvation, meaning uh, we are delivered from the penalty of hell, that all we have to do is recognize that we're a sinner. And because of my sin, I've offended a holy, righteous God, and I deserve that awful place called hell. But Jesus paid my price, and I must personally accept him to be my savior. I don't have to do anything to get saved. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man shall boast. I don't have to do anything to make myself saved. In fact, to build on that, I don't have to do anything to keep myself saved. That Jesus has done all the work and everything that he does is perfect. That means I'm going to heaven whether I want to or not. Now, some people say, well, if I don't have to do anything to be saved and I don't have to do anything to keep myself saved, then I don't have to do anything. That is the wrong conclusion. You see, I don't serve God in order to get something from him. I serve him because of what he's done for me. See, there's a different motive. You see, if people are trying to serve the Lord in order to be saved or stay saved, then what they're doing is they're doing it for themselves. I'm trying to keep myself out of hell. I'm doing this. And your motive gets wrong because you get tired. How long do I have to keep doing this in order to make sure I'm going to heaven? How long do I have to put my... And you put yourself in bondage and that's not what God wants us to have. He has already said that he's given us the law of liberty. We have the liberty to serve God. I don't have to, I get to. It's a privilege that I have. So if I don't have to do anything to keep myself saved, then why do anything? Because I'm thankful for what God has done for me. Because of what he's done for me. I now have the motive of love. I'm doing it not because I have to, but because I want to. Now my motive is pure. Now I'm willing to serve God instead of begrudgingly. I don't have to go to church. I get to go to church. I don't have to read my Bible. I get to read my Bible. Everything changes because of motive. Everything is different now because of this. Now, I'm glad to serve God because of what he's done for me. Now, in a human perspective, just looking man to man, we know that God sees the hearts. But the thing is, is I can't see your heart. It is illegal for me to try. All right? I, I can't see your heart. So the only way that I as a human can tell that you as another human is saved is by how you live your life, by what you say and how you behave and how you act. That is the evidence of salvation. You know, there's nothing like trying to do a funeral with someone who made a profession of faith but hasn't darkened the door of a church in years. That cussed up a storm and and was mean to his neighbors and kicked the cat and Okay, well, it's hard to say, hey, this guy's going to heaven because he made a profession of faith. And people are like, what? Well, you know, that, that makes it difficult because there's no outside evidence for people to say, oh, yeah. They just said he was a mean old man. You're telling me he's going to heaven because he said a prayer? It makes it difficult. You understand? Yeah. Now, that man could have legitimately been saved, but it makes it very hard for a human to human to be able to say, Okay, yeah, sure, that guy's a Christian. Does that make sense? So this is what it's talking about here. Let's kind of just hit some context. It's verse number, um, uh, let's start at verse number 19 just again. Thou believest that there is one God. Great, wonderful, but guess what? Thou doest well, but the devils also believe and tremble. Do you know that the devils believe that there's a God? They don't deny there's a God, they've met him. They're under his authority. All right, so it's not a big deal for them to say that they believe. Now, what we're doing is that some people, oh, yeah, I believe. I'm a believer. Oh, great, you're in good company. <laughs> Even the devils believe. So what? I, I can't tell you're a Christian just because you said some words. Verse number 20, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that word vain means empty, that faith without works is dead. So here it's talking to someone who's, hey, I'm a believer. But I don't have to go to church. Well, technically, you don't have to go to church. But you should want to because of what God's done for you. 
I'm a believer, but I don't have to read my Bible. Well, technically you don't have to read your Bible, but you should want to read your Bible. Does that make sense? And a person without any type of desire or outward showing that he's doing that, he's an empty faith. I'm a Christian, but I don't look, smell, or act like one. Okay, well, that's an empty faith. You could have legitimately trusted Christ as your Savior, but there's no evidence. You have an empty life because of it. it doesn't match up. It's hollow. So what God does is he goes and uses two illust- uh, Old Testament illustrations to help back this up. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? So let's cover this story. So in the Old Testament, God had called Abraham from the Ur of Chaldees to himself to follow after him to a land that he didn't know. Along the way, God had promised Abraham that he was going to have a son. And Abraham waited 40 something years to have this kid. Abraham's now 100 years old when he has this kid. Now, 30 years later, Abraham's 133, Isaac is 33. God wanted to test Abraham to see, hey, do you love this son more than me? Or are you willing to trust me with your son? So Abraham, come to the land I tell you of Mount Moriah. I want you to take my, your son and I want you to sacrifice him. Just to prove to see who is number one in your life. Will you trust God? And so Abraham did. And just as he's getting ready to plunge the knife down, God sends an angel to say, Abraham, stop. And Abraham was very glad to stop. Amen. And it says here that when Abraham went to go sacrifice Isaac, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Here's the question. Did Abraham get saved there? No, he did not. But was this evidence that he was saved? Absolutely. So here, he was justified by his works, meaning that his works proved that his profession was true. Does that make sense? It's an evidence. To call yourself a Christian, you should have works evidencing. You're not working in order to get something from God. You should be working because of who God is. So may we say that someone who says, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't want to go to church. Are they being unreasonable? Yeah, absolutely. Because God has done this for you're not going to church because you want to stay saved. You should do it because of what God has done for you. And if you're saying, listen, I know God that you saved me from hell and you died on the cross, but you know what? It's just too much to go to church. Is that an unreasonable statement? God, I know that you saved me and then you wrote me some love letters to tell me how much you love me, but you know what? I don't want to read that. Is that unreasonable? Absolutely. And so what we're seeing here is that if we are truly saved, that our works are going to give evidence to proof to other people that we are saved. He goes on and gives another illustration of Rahab the harlot. Rahab, of course, in the book of Joshua, had hid those spies and then later on put the scarlet thread out there. Now, why did she hide the spies? Did she hide the spies in order to get saved? No, if you go and study the story, she had already believed that the God of the Hebrews was a real God. She already trusted him. And this was evidence that she did believe that God was real. She was justified by her works. How do you know that Rahab believed that God was real? By her actions. How do we trust that any believer believes God is real? By their actions. Does it make sense? Now, this is the backdrop from a very important phrase. Notice with me at the end of verse 23. It says, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he, Abraham, was called the friend of God. Can you imagine what a powerful statement that is? Think in your mind going to a grave site. And you go look at a specific gravestone and it has someone's name and has the date they were born and a little dash and the date afterwards. And oftentimes they'll have a little statement. This little statement summarizes that person's life, that he was killed by, um, by, a, a, <laughs> by a gunslinger for the price of $25 or, you know, it, they, they have something that just satis- uh, states that person's life. Well, if you can look at the epitaph of Abraham, what was Abraham known for? This is the statement, the friend of God. Now, with this, we also see who is saying it. Three times in the Bible, 
it is referenced that this is Abraham, the friend of God. And each of those three times, it was made reference because God said it. Could you imagine what a close relationship you'd have to have for God to say, that is my friend. That's my friend. When we think about this, do you know that God wants to have a close relationship with each and every one of us? The whole reason why God created man in the first place was for fellowship. God wanted to fellowship with man. He wanted to spend time with him, wanted to hang out with him. But what broke that fellowship? Sin. sin. That sin broke that fellowship. And that they, God could not have fellowship with man once again until that sin was paid for. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ paid that price to allow us to restore that fellowship. Now once again we can have a close relationship with God. And that's what God wants. You know what that God is looking for today? He's looking for a friend. In the Old Testament, it is amazing to see how these uh, Old Testament characters are referenced to, how they're depicted. For example, you had Adam who walked with God in the cool of the garden. Mm -hmm. Now, when it said that he walked with God, was that a figurative thing or was that a literal thing? Mm -hmm. It was literal. Abraham or Adam literally walked with God in the form of Jesus in the garden. Now, if you're going to walk with someone in the garden, doesn't that denote some, a close relationship? Absolutely. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? They're in fellowship together. They're talking with each other. They're walking and just enjoying each other's company. That's a close relationship. That's what God wants. You take Enoch later on in the book of Genesis. Enoch walked with God and one day, they, as they're walking, God says, you know what? You're closer to my house than your house. Why don't you come up with me? And Enoch got translated up to heaven. He didn't die. That's a close relationship with God, right? When God says, you know what? You're so close to me, I don't even want you to die. Just come on up. That's pretty close. You had Moses who spoke to God face to face as with a man. That means that God spoke to Moses personally, face to face. Is that a close relationship? And then you had Abraham who three times in scripture was called the friend of God. God wants to have close relationship. One of our problems is, is that as New Testament Christians, we know more about Christ doctrinally, meaning on paper, whereas the Old Testament saints knew more about Christ personally, meaning that they had an experiential walk with God. They spent time with him, not just facts and figures, they knew him, they talked to him, they spent time with him. And that's what God wants for all of us. He wants a friend. He wants someone to be close with. So if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about being the friend of God. And the first thing I really want to spend time with is what is required to be friends with God. In fact, what is required to be friends with anyone? Take your Bibles, if you don't mind, and turn with me to the gospel record of John. The gospel record of John in chapter 15. In John chapter 15, Jesus Christ is walking with his disciples, heading to the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that in a matter of hours, he's going to be arrested, put in a legal trial. He's going to be convicted and put on a cruel cross. So Jesus is talking with his disciples in a personal setting and giving them these final instructions before he's taken away from them. And with this in John 15, he mentions several times this idea of friends. So Let's see the requirements that is necessary to be friends. In fact, let me pause here. Let me see if you guys can guess. I went off scripts. So you can't even look in your books. It's not even in there. So in order to be friends with someone, there are three basic requirements to be friends with anyone. So maybe not even think about your friends with God. What about your human friends? What are, there's one of, uh, there's three. So give me one. Spending time with them. If you don't spend time with them, you can never be close with them. All right, Miss Sarah, you had one? Trust. trust is exactly right. If you don't trust them, you can't be close to them. Very good. And there's one more that's kind of on the side of hanging. Let's, 
um, that carries with the idea of trust and time. You become more like-minded. Trust and time. Good. Let's see what Jesus has to say. John chapter 15. And let's see the three things that are required in order to be friends with anyone, much less God. Notice with me John 15 and notice with me starting at verse 13. John 15 and verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We're going to alliterate here, but uh, let's use the word compassion. Compassion. Or may we say like this, some type of emotional attachment, compassion. If you're not have any type of emotional compassion to someone, you're not going to be friends with them. You have to have some sort of like or love. Could you imagine two people that say, hey, we're friends, but I don't like you. I just, I'm here. That wouldn't be a close friendship, would it? I just tolerate your presence. All right. There has to be an emotional. You have to want to be with them. If you, if you are going to have any type of relationship with a husband and wife, with friends or God, there needs to be an emotional attachment. Love, like, something. You'll never be close to anyone if there's not this emotional, compa- uh, uh, n- emotional component. So we have the word compassion. Compassion. This is an ingredient. Uh, Being friends, we have to have compassion. Notice as Jesus goes on, he brings up this word friend again. Verse number 14. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. We see a second ingredient. We have the word confidence. Remember, I'm alliterated. We could say the word trust too, but confidence, trust. In this, Jesus isn't saying, listen, you're my friend if you just do whatever I tell you to do. That's not the emphasis here. Here, it's saying, because I trust you, if I give you something to do, you'll do it. You understand that? For example, um, I love my oldest daughter. I love all my kids, but my oldest daughter. And because uh, she loves a little red bear, and for a long time, she couldn't sleep if she didn't have it. Because it went missing one day, and I don't care about the bear, but because she does, and uh, she can't find her bear, I'm going to go search for that bear. Right? Because this is what she needs me to do, I'm going to go do it. Does that make sense? We all have things that we have friendships, you know, husband and wives. I don't care, but my wife wants this done, so I'm going to go do it because... She's put confidence in me. There's a trust there. It's something I could do. Does it make sense? This has to be an element there. There has to be an element of trust or confidence. If Jesus is going to be our friend, if we're going to be friends with God, there has to be a trust. By the way, trust goes two ways. First of all, we know theologically I can trust God, but that doesn't mean you trust him. Does that make sense? You have to trust him or you'll never be close to him. But the same thing on the other side. Can God trust you? In the book of Genesis 18, I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time. God uh, tells Abraham, hey, guess what? This time next year, you're going to have a son. Good. Then he says, "Um, should I tell Abraham what I'm going to do? He sends his two angels to Sodom to go pull Lot out. And he says, should I tell Abraham what I'm going to do? Yeah. And it says this, I know him that he'll train his household well, that they'll teach him to follow me. You know what God said? He's talking to himself, trying to think if he wants to tell Abraham what he's going to do. He says, yes, I'm going to tell him because I trust him. I know he's going to do what's right. I could trust him to do what I tell him. I could trust him to train others. So then God says, Abraham, come here. I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and the seven cities of the plain. I'm just going to wipe them out. And Abraham says, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second, God. Uh, What happens if you find 50 saved people? And God says, I won't destroy them for 50 saved people. And Abraham says, well, forgive me. I know I'm nobody, but what if you find five missing from that? What if you find 45? God says, I won't destroy it for 45. He says, God, again, forgive me. uh, But what happens if you find five lack of that? What if there's 40? I won't destroy it for 40. Okay, God, 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 you've been very patient with me, but what if you find less than that? What about 30? I won't destroy it for 30. 20? No, I won't destroy it for 20. God, uh, one last time. 
What if you find just 10 saved people? Will you not destroy those seven cities for 10 saved people? God says, I won't destroy it for seven saved, or 10 saved people. Think about that relationship. God was able to talk with Abraham and Abraham was able to express his feelings to God because God trusted him. They had a friendship there that Abraham felt like he could talk with him and spend time with him. Isn't that amazing? There's this idea of confidence, this idea of trust that I know him and he's going to do what's right. Remember, trust goes two ways. Can you honestly trust God or are you depending on yourself? And can God trust you with information, instructions, orders? Can God trust you? That should, that's an element of friendship that we should have with God. If we're going to be the friends of God, we have to have compassion. There has to be an emotional attachment. There needs to be confidence. And then there's something else. Notice as we go on, verse 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what my Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for in all things that I have heard of my Father, I have been made known to you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that you should bring forth fruit, and that your fruit shall remain, and that whatsoever you ask of my Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. The third element here is companionship, that we have to spend time with him. That's an element. If you don't spend time with anyone, that relationship will get further apart. We all said in high school, we're going to be friends forever. And then you left high school and you went your way and you didn't spend time with them and their, your relationship became more and more distant. Next time you meet them, hi, how are you? We need to catch up sometime. But there's no longer that intimate closeness that you once had. That's true of anything. The less time that you spend with anyone, the less closeness you have. But the more time you spend with someone, the more of an intimacy that you will have. You know, this happens even husband and wives. Husband and wives can sit in the same house and not have a closeness because they don't spend time together. They're in the same building, but that's it. There needs to be a closeness, an intimacy that goes along with that if we're going to be friends with anyone. Let me kind of instruct us a little bit. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs 18. Now this is powerful. God wants to have friends. That's why he created us in the first place. But sin got in the way. Jesus paid that price so we can once again have fellowship. Now it's up to us. God is already available to have friends. It's up to us to say, I want to be your friend. The book of Proverbs chapter 18. The book of Proverbs chapter 18. And there's a verse here at the very end of verse 18 that oftentimes people take and put it into two separate parts when they actually belong together. Notice with me Proverbs 18 and verse number 24. Proverbs 18 verse 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now that last statement usually is put apart. Hey, there's a friend that sticketh closer than the brother. Of course there is. Who is that friend that sticketh closer than the brother? Jesus. Jesus. But you know, if that last part is about Jesus, then the first part tells us about how to get close to Jesus. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. What does this mean? This means that there is work involved. Some people don't have close friends with Jesus or anyone else because they're not willing to put forth the work. Being friends with anyone takes work. Yep. Why? Because they're different. You're different than them. They're different than you. And you have to learn how to coexist together. You have to learn to be able to work with them. You need to be willing to... Um, put forth the effort. What happens if they don't give uh, what you want? Do you just walk away? Fine, it's just too hard. All relationships take work. Ask any married couple. All relationships take work. Absolutely. It takes work. And if we're going to be friends with God, it's not going to come just by sitting around going, okay, God, I'm available. You have to put forth the work. Any relationship requires work. That's why a lot of people aren't friends with God is they're not willing to put forth the work to have that closeness with God. I don't want to spend time with God. That sounds like work. 
man, uh, I don't want God to have to trust me. He's probably going to put me to work. I don't want to have an emotional attachment to him. Eh, it sounds like work. It is. But is it a good work? Absolutely. You have to be willing to put forth the work. It's not going to come by accident. You're not going to roll over in your bed one day and wake up. Go, Whoa, I was accidentally friends with God. This is great. It is a purposeful and intentional decision. Now, if we're going to spend time with God, what are the two main ways we spend time with God? Someone? Jessica? Reading your Bible is one. When we read our Bible, God speaks to us. The other? Prayer. Prayer. In prayer, we speak to God. Now, normally people, when they speak to God, they give God a laundry list. God, before I get home today, I expect you to do the laundry, wash the dishes, clean the car, and kick the cat. Right? We, we talk to God and we give God a laundry list. So often we talk at God rather than talk with God. What do you mean? What do I mean is, when's the last time you asked God, how's your day going? How are you feeling today? What's on your mind? I mean, we're very quick at telling him how bad we feel. We're not much of a friend if we don't ask someone else who's supposed to be our friend about what's going on with them. This friendship should go two ways. So often we dump everything at God and we don't even speak to him. We speak at him, but we don't speak with him. We don't allow him to talk to us. We don't allow him to have a chance. We like to carry the conversation and dominate it. And, but we're supposed to have a friendship. Do you think when Adam walked with God in the cool of the garden that he was just talking and God was just being quiet? No, if he was smart, he said, God, you teach me. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Keep going, Right? When Moses, when God spoke to Moses face to face as a friend, was it Moses telling God about everything that was going on? No. God was saying, was on. give a good example of that. God said, Moses, get out of the way. I'm going to kill them all. Moses said, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. You brought them out. You need to carry your name. Uh, let's not do this. Now let's pause. Was God going to kill the people? No. Then why did God say that? Because God was having an emotional. Can God have emotions? Do you need a vent sometimes? Yes. And who do you vent to? Your friend, hopefully, right? Mm -hmm. Because they care enough to listen to your rants. Yep. God needed to rant. Normally, he didn't have anybody to rant to. Do you think people frustrate him? Isn't it nice to be able to rant to someone? That's what God was doing. That was the friendship that they had. That there was a trust there and they spent so much time that Moses felt like he could tell God anything and God felt like he could tell Moses anything. Moses, I am just so frustrated with these folks here. Think about that. God wants to have friends. It takes work. Think about how lonely God must be now. If God wants to have friends, but it takes work, God's available, but he wants us to put forth the work to be friends. How many friends do you really think God has? Well, turn with me, if you don't mind, to the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel, if you wouldn't mind, and in chapter 22. Ezekiel 22. So if you're in Proverbs, keep going. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, then you get to the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22, and notice with me if you don't mind, Ezekiel 22. I'll wait for you to get there. I want to show you one of the scariest verses in all the Bible. Ezekiel 22. Ezekiel 22, and notice with me if you don't mind in verse 30. Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. And I, this is God speaking, sought for a man. Notice that a is in the singular. He's not looking for a bunch of people. He's looking for a person, a man, a woman. 
I sought for a man among them that should take up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land. I'm looking for a person to stand in the gap. Someone to go between heaven and earth. Someone to say, God, this is what the people need. And they turn around and say, God, people, this is what God said. Someone that God can trust to be in that spot. Someone that God can trust to plead with them. God, please don't destroy the land. Please watch over. The, please forgive the people. Stand in the gap to talk with him, to be there in that trusted position. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me in the land that I should not destroy it. I'm looking for a reason not to destroy it. But notice these last four haunting words. But I found none. I looked for a friend, one person that I can trust and I found none. That was in Ezekiel's day. Where do you think God's at in our day? Do you think he has someone that he can trust to be his friend? Someone to put forth the work to spend time. Someone who's willing to have an emotional attachment with God. Someone who's willing to be trusted of God and to trust God. Someone who's willing to put forth and spend the time. God is looking for a friend and he wants to be friends. It is available. It's not some foreign concept. God wants this. But I found none. We have the testimony of Abraham that he was called three times in scripture that he was God's friend. What about today? Is there anyone who'd be willing to take up that mantle? Be willing to have that testimony. Spend time with God that God can say, you know what? That's my friend. That's someone I can trust. That's someone that I could be with. That's someone I could rant to. That's someone I could tell about my day. But I found none. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.